In this episode of Ask Paul Cutley, we're going to talk about extracting tinder from inner bark, minimizing smoke from fires, and first aid training for young people. Welcome, welcome to episode 76 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions about wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life in general. Now I'm back in the south of England and it is still warm here as I record this in the UK. We have had weeks and weeks of fine warm weather. I know it's bothering some of the farmers. Um, it's causing a lot of the grass to be very dry but here in the woods it's nice and green the sun is shining and it is very very pleasant indeed um, without further ado then let us have a look at today's questions the first one is from andrew via the speak pipe facility on my blog that's where you can go into my blog find ask paul kirtley in the um, main menu go down you can press record you can leave me a voicemail which is a really efficient way of leaving uh, a message and it's nice to hear people's voices as well i always like getting emails and messages etc but i think there's something quite special about getting a voice message like this one hello paul this is andrew I have a question regarding uh, extracting tinder material from the inner bark of sweet chestnut, which I've read about, um, but I've never had any luck uh, finding it. It just seems very flaky or there's not enough. It's very laborious. So it's much easier to go and find um, dead bracken or honeysuckle, but I'm determined to try and do it. I presume it's the same part of the plant that on the green wood when it's alive we use to make cordage but um yeah so i thought you were the man to ask if you have any tips um and techniques for making that process any easier thanks in advance great so um if you're not familiar with the species that Andrew is asking about, um, sweet chestnut, that's Castanea sativa. It's a Southern European species of edible chestnut, um, quite similar to American chestnut, not at all related to horse chestnut though, at the conkers. Yeah, what we're talking about are the edible chestnuts that you would roast over an open fire as the old Christmas song goes. Um, that you would make a stuffing from, that you would make chestnut puree from, that type of chestnut. And um, it has been quite widely introduced and the inner bark is quite fibrous. And so as Andrew has alluded to, you can take the inner bark and you can make cordage with it. Um, you scrape off the outer bark and like willow, you then use that inner bark for making cordage. Um, you can also make baskets and containers from the bark in the same way that you might use ash, for example. So it's a useful species from that perspective. To make tinder from that same material, you have to get the material in a different condition. So whereas you might collect the bark off a green uh, living plant for the cordage or for the baskets, what you want for the tinder is you want a tree that is dead and you want one where the bark is starting to rot away from the trunk. Um, it's better when you've got quite large um, examples um, rather than really small, thin material. And it's similar with oak, for example. You, you, you can take the inner bark of oak and use it for uh, making a bird's nest tinder bundle where you might take an ember from a bow drill set for example and blow that into flame that's the sort of thing that we're talking about just in case people are wondering what on earth andrew is asking about and what on earth i'm talking about so we want to make that kind of bird's nest tinder bundle um that uh that fluffy literally like a bird's nest fibrous material and um, where we may have broken it up and buffed it up and the way to get that from sweet chestnut is you find a downed tree typically 
that has been down for some time, a number of years. And what you'll get, particularly on the underside of a horizontal uh, limb, a uh, horizontal trunk, is you will get the bark starting to rot away. It's exactly the reason we don't collect firewood from horizontal uh, pieces if we can avoid it. We want dead, dry, standing wood because you don't get a lot of water penetration into the, into the wood. Whereas as soon as you've got something that's horizontal, you get gravity pulling water into the wood and you also get um, water running around and pooling under the, and, and dripping off the underside as well as getting into cracks in the bark as they form and pooling inside between the, the wood and the bark. Um, and if it's on the ground, you also get moisture being trapped there as well. So you, you've got this damp environment where things start to rot and break down. And so if you're finding um, the bark too difficult to remove, that's because it's not in the right condition. And if it's, if it's dry, it doesn't come away very easy. You actually want something that's quite damp and quite rotten where all of the bark, the outer bark included, just comes off and you can pull it off. And then once you start getting it and you can sort of tear it along and you get a strip of it. And when you find the right piece, it just comes off really easily. And then you turn it and look at the inside and you will see a, a kind of dark, orangey red, uh, maybe burgundy uh, coloration. If it's still quite a light color, it's probably still quite um, integral and quite integrated as, as, a, as a fibers in the, in, the, in, the, in the remaining inner bark. What you want is where the inner bark has started to rot away and you can scrape and pull the fibers out quite easily. And they tend to be like an orangey red color at that point, a bit darker when they're really wet. And so you're then pulling that away you can scrape your fingernails along across the fibers and just pull it right out and it comes away in nice big strips. It's something I do on um, some of my courses because it doesn't just teach you about um, sweet chestnut, um, although it teaches you specifically about sweet chestnut, um, but I also appreciate that that isn't the most widespread of species. You don't get it much in the north of England, for example, or Scotland. Um, and you don't get it much in the north of the northern temperate and you certainly don't get it in the, in the boreal. But um, where you do get it, it's useful, um, but also it teaches you that principle of how to take an inner bark. And as I say, there are other inner barks that you can use, whether there's certain species of poplar, whether there's certain species of oak, and there are others as well, where you can remove uh, the fibers, but you tend to want to have the bark still attached to the trunk, but rotting away so that it's kind of pulling away. And it's the same with if you wanted to use um, some of the tilia species, so the basswoods um, and the limes. Again, you want the outer uh, bark to be starting to, to rot away and the inner bark starting to separate from the wood and starting to disintegrate a little bit. And I've got the sun right on my face there, sun in my eyes, and that's probably playing havoc with the video camera. Um, and it's certainly making me, me squint, but it'll go around behind that next uh, spruce tree in a second. But that's how, that's how you do it, basically. You need to find it in a rotten condition, um, Andrew. Pull away a big sheet and then strip out the, uh, the fibers from the inside. I'll see if I can, uh, I can make a video about it at some point. I'll add it to my list because it's one that isn't obvious, which is why I include it even on some of my basic courses, because then you know the obvious things like bracken and honeysuckle, etc. people remember that and it's not too much of a leap for them to understand other materials that are like it. But even if I've shown people bracken and honeysuckle and some of the other uh, fibrous materials, plant fibers, etc., um, it's not obvious how to get the materials from inner barks, which is why I show one on some of my courses. So I think I might make a video on that at some point, but hopefully that description has helped you understand it's about the condition that the bark's in really damp and starting to disintegrate and rot down and you should be able to pull those fibers out nicely and let me know how you get on minimizing smoke from fires this is a question via instagram using the hashtag ask paul curtly and his question is, Dear Paul, this picture was taken at the annual Mirbils Bonfire Festival on the island of Texel, where I live in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, I cannot go there anymore because the smoke acts an, as an asthma trigger, which I must try to avoid if possible. However, I would still like to be able to practice some fire lighting techniques and then, of course, the use of fire for cooking, heating and social gatherings. Does this 
with doing this with as little smoke as possible is my priority. Where do I start? There are so many aspects to fire. All the best, L's. Okay. Well. I'm just thinking about smoky fires. People will know me or know why that's uh, funny. Um, people who work with me. Smoky fires tend to occur because of moisture in the wood. That's the primary reason. If you're gonna put somewhat damp wood on a fire, it's going to more often than not be smoky because you get that incomplete combustion. You can also, of course, get smoke from resins and other materials in barks in particular. And so um, one of the things I would say is uh, to minimize smoke is to make sure the wood is as dry as possible, dead, standing, that has been seasoned, it's been dead for some time, it didn't just die last week, because dead standing wood that's been dead for a week is still gonna be full of moisture, so it needs to be dead, standing, and dry. That's a good place to start. As I say, some barks can be quite smoky. Um, I've noticed as well that barks with some lichens growing on the outside can be quite smoky as well. So one thing you might want to do is minimize the amount of bark that you're burning. Maybe just take it off with an ax, just scrape it off or what have you to really minimize the smoke if it's really gonna bother you. Because I find, going back to sweet chestnut for example, around here there are certain uh, species that grow on the bark and I find even if the wood's quite dry, that sort of decomposing bark that can be, again, maybe a little bit damp, but pretty much dry with these um, lichens on the outside, tend to be quite smoky, even if the wood's dry. Taking that off, you get a much cleaner, cleaner burn. So that's something you could do. Um, outer barks can be a little bit damp anyway, even if the wood's dry, so it's another reason to, to remove them. And then you will want to avoid burning some of the uh, species where you're gonna get acrid smokes because of, uh, because of the, uh, the resin in them. So just looking around here, there's Scots pine and there's Norway spruce here. Both of those I don't like burning in relatively confined spaces because they tend to be quite smoky. If you look at the smoke that comes off them, if you put a billy can over them, for example, and burn them, you tend to get quite a lot of resi black residue, more even than some other woods, and that's because of the resin in there. So I would avoid the resinous needled species um, in particular, and I would try and stick to hardwoods, and I would stick to hardwoods burning them without the bark on and making sure that they're dry. Um, that's more effort than it is for some of us, um, but if you want a really uh, clean fire, those are things that I would be looking at in particular. Non-resinous woods that are really dry and don't burn the barks and you're gonna have a lot better results. So, you know, willows, oaks, fruit woods, apples, that type of thing, um, hawthorn, uh, beech, that type of wood that's really dry, you should get a nice, hot, clean flame from. And then of course, make sure it's getting plenty of oxygen as well, making sure you've got that balance. Um, the fire triangle, heat, fuel, and oxygen, making sure that that's in, in good balance so that you're getting a good, clean, full combustion, a fuller combustion as possible to minimize the smoke. Hopefully that helps. First aid for young people, and this is from Robert. And Robert asks, uh, this is by email, by the way, so that's another way of sending me a message. What level of first aid would you teach 12 year olds? I wanted to take a couple of classes and I wanted to take the kids with me. On your EDC everyday carry in town and bush, what do you carry on your person? Um, are you ask, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking about first aid kit there or just general, I can sort of answer both um, in, in, in brief. Um, but to the main question, first aid for young people, I would teach them the basic life support. You know, so you know, if you're talking about outdoor first aid, go and do a, an outdoor, first, outdoor oriented first aid course that covers basic life support. So your danger, response, airway, breathing, uh, circulation, that stuff is, is, is the core of any first aid. And you know, there are, there are cases where um, kids have used that or have been aware enough of medical conditions that they have phoned for help 
and done the right thing in the meantime, whether that's put somebody in a recovery position or, or whatever it is, I think that basic life support, that basic uh, first responder knowledge, you can teach that to kids. Of course, there are some you know, aspects that might make them a bit queasy, you know, if we're talking about bleeding and what have you, and I know some trainers show some quite graphic uh, photographs of accidents and wounds and things to, to try and get you in the right mindset and to give you some experience so that it's not such a shock to you when you might have to deal with like a serious bleed or what have you. But you can talk to the trainer about that and I'm sure any good trainer would be sensitive to the fact that they had uh, say a 12 year old in the class. But I remember doing some basic first day training when I was in scouts around about that age and it was it was really really useful and you know th that basic um, understanding of uh, preserving the airway um, making sure people are put in a recovery position or that the airway is protected, that it's opened, etc. that to see whether or not someone's breathing, at what point to go and get help, to be able to deal with um, wounds and bleeding, etc. That's all really, really core stuff and it doesn't change. The more advanced you get, the, there might be more advanced techniques around that, but the basics are the same. So I would, I would just go there and do you know, a couple of days of basic life support, first responder style training, whatever it's called in your territory or, or your locality, and, um, and go from there. So as to your other question about everyday carry, well, I've, uh, I've answered that in a way in the past. I've got uh, an article that I wrote uh, called The uh, Seven Items I Never Leave Home Without, and that's very much aimed at being out in, in wilder places. Um, that's something that I think I can refer to. I'll link to it um, under the videos in the show notes, as well as um, I'll put a link on the YouTube video so that you can link to that article. Um, don't get too fixated on the exact make and model. It's more a case of the principles, like I, I like a good strong uh, belt knife, um, a metal mug so that I can boil water, um, a water bottle so that I can store water, for example. And there are a number of other items there. You can see that. So that is um, my thinking on some key things to have. What I always like to have in my pocket is some sort of pocket knife and some sort of fire lighting device, normally a ferro rod or fire steel, however you like to, to call it. And I'll typically either have a, 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 a locking um, pocket knife or a Swiss Army knife, um, depending on where I am and what I'm doing in my pocket. Now, if you're asking about first aid kits specifically, um, I, and I wasn't sure if you were talking about first aid kits from an everyday carry point of view, I do tend to have a small cuts kit on me, definitely in the woods, often in town, um, when I'm also out with um, more than just myself, um, I will have a small kit with me um, for dealing with uh, maybe other uh, people's issues. If I'm on a more uh, serious wilderness trip, I will have a bigger kit with me. So it depends on what I'm doing. And it's the same with um, you know, what's on your person. If I'm doing a canoe trip, then I'm going to have a buoyancy aid on or a PFD, whatever you want to call it. And in there, I'm going to want a rescue knife. I'm going to want a, 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 la a lamp. Um, I may have other rescue gear like carabiner and some tape and other bits and pieces that I can use while I'm on the river. Um, if I'm on a wilderness trip, um, specifically where it can be an issue, if I'm separated from my boat, if my, particularly if it's only me and one other person on the river in one boat, if that boat gets uh, stranded, if it gets pinned somewhere and we can't get it, I want to be on the riverbank with a belt knife and a saw and a means of lighting fire and a few of the bits and pieces on my person. And I've answered questions about that on on this show before. Um, I'll see if I can link to one of those. Somebody asked me about scenario quite a while ago. I think it was Andrew Casey asked me about scenario of being separated from a canoe on a river trip in a wilderness situation. And I talked through what I might do in that situation with the things I would likely have on my person. And I will link to that in, uh, I can link to the YouTube video on the video here and I'll link to uh, the relevant episode of Ask Paul Curley in the show notes below as well. Um, so yeah, there are some core things like a, a pocket knife and a fire steel that I might always want to have on my person, but then it's also situationally dependent. You know, if I'm out in the woods and I'm working with an ax, I want a tourniquet and a field dressing on my person. Maybe I've just got my normal small cuts kit when I'm using a knife 
Um, but then if I'm using an axe or a, or a machete or parang in a, in, a, in a more tropical situation, I want a tourniquet and a, and a, and a, and a first field dressing on me so that I can deal with any uh, wounds, um, hopefully um, sufficiently well to, to, to contain them. And also, particularly if I'm working with other people who are also using those similar tools, I want to have those uh, on me at least as well. So. I think in terms of everyday carry, it's very difficult to put one set together that deals with every single circumstance without ending up with a massive kit. But there are some core things that I always like to have on me, and I think I've explained those. And then there are some core things that I like to have on me in different situations that are specific to those situations. And those situations are not gonna take you by surprise. If I'm doing a two week canoe trip, I know I'm going on a two week canoe trip and I will take um, suitable survival, rescue, emergency gear with me for those, you know, I'll take an expedition first aid kit, I will take a satellite phone and spare batteries, I will take the things that I've talked about in terms of buoyancy aid, etc. Whereas if I'm doing a hiking trip, I'm going to take a different set of equipment because I'm in a different, I'm not in a river, I'm not around rapids, I'm not um, in the same situation. Similarly, um, if I'm in the mountains in winter, I'm going to have different survival equipment with me to what I might have if I'm in the forest in the summer. Um, I'm putting myself into those situations. And I know with everyday carry, you're probably talking about um, small items on your person. Those small items on my person typically tend to stay the same, as I say. Um, another one on my blog you might want to look at is um, my concept of building uh, a possible pouch if you like um, but rather than this concept of building a survival kit and then having everyday carry items I explored this idea of sort of thinking about what you might want to have with you that you're using and putting together a kit that is items that you can use every day that you're not going to diminish and that are actually more useful to you every day but also could serve you as a survival kit as well and um, I'll link to that um, on the YouTube video and below as well. So that that um, doesn't answer the question cleanly, I know that, but um, there are different parameters for different situations and there's some core stuff. I am gonna make a video about how I typically organize my pocket gear um, when I'm in the woods, when I'm working in the woods or I'm around camp on a canoe trip, for example, in the evenings, things I like to have on my pocket, all in my pockets all the time, things that I like to have in my pockets around camp, when I'm working in the woods, when I'm working on courses, when I'm hiking, etc. cetera. Um, I've got a system that is pretty much the same. And I think that may an help answer the question further as well um, in a framework kind of way. And then you can tag on these other bits. It's like the skins of an onion. Um, you've got stuff that's very close to you and then things that are further out. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, I felt like maybe I uh, ex was a bit expansive there, but that might give you a bit more of my thinking on those things. Well, thank you for your questions. Um, the sun's getting a little bit lower now and I am gonna continue with my day. Um, I was visiting one of our courses earlier on today and um, this afternoon, this evening, I've been taking the opportunity with the nice weather to, uh, to make some videos as well. Um, some of my team are running the course that, that, that finished today and it was nice to see those guys and it was nice to see the students on that course. I've got a number of other courses coming up as well and then I will uh, and then I've got some more uh, wilderness adventures coming up as well and I'll see if I can manage to record some of these in those different spots as and when I'm doing those things and and share some of what we're doing with you um, that way too. Also on my channel I'm starting to do some other shorter videos, some how-to videos as well as some longer uh, trip videos hopefully over time. Um, do have a look at what else is going on on my channel, not just the Ask Paul Kirtleys on my YouTube channel. Have a look at those and see what's going on. I know the Ask Paul Kirtleys go out as a podcast as well. If you're a podcast only listener please do check out my uh, YouTube channel. You can find it very easily. Just type in paulkirtley.tv and it will take you straight to my YouTube channel. Uh, easy URL for you to remember there, Paul Kirtley, 
www.aspaulkirtley.tv. That will take you to my YouTube channel. If you are a regular podcast listener to Ask Paul Kirtley, I think you will enjoy a lot of what's on my YouTube channel if you don't follow it already. I would love for you to subscribe there and for you to see the other things that I'm doing there. Of course, Ask Paul Kirtley works as an audio only. That's why I do it as a Q&A in the way that I do. But I'd also like to do some more show and tell things on my YouTube channel that I think a lot of you who listen to the podcast as a uh, listen to Ask Paul Kirtley as a podcast would benefit from as well. I think you're going to get into that and enjoy it. So love to see you over on my YouTube channel as well as listening to these shows if you're not there already. If you're watching this on my YouTube channel, thank you. If you don't already subscribe, please do. And if you're watching this on my blog, then also make sure you get the emails from my blog and you can get all of those things as well um, you know that you can get the emails from my blog you can get my youtube videos and you can get my podcasts as well um, all of that goes out on a regular basis and i look forward to talking to you whichever way you uh, consume these ask paul kirtley sessions i look forward to talking to you again before too long and enjoy your outdoor life hopefully that has helped and I look forward to your questions. Take care.